Hi. Everyone can hear me okay? Cool. Cool. So I'm a fuzzy knob or Josh Schwartz, depending on if we share a bed together or not. I don't know. Uh, so this talk is red teaming back and forth by Vever. Um, you can like this if you cry every time. And if you get that reference, you should laugh. Yeah, like two people. That's what I thought. So uh, <laughs> this is actually my uh, fourth year at DerbyCon, my first year speaking here. So I'm really excited to be doing that. Um, OK, let's, I I'd like to start with a survey. Um, you can go ahead and like raise a hand or raise a finger or like do some nods or something like that. But who here is on red team? And that's like anyone who breaks stuff for a job, red teamers, pen testers, you know, maybe people who write exploits. How about people who do that kind of stuff in their free time? Yeah, okay. How about blue team? Who's the, who's the blue team people here? Anyone is keeping things secure, protecting us? Good, awesome. Anyone on drunk team? Guys, what the hell? It's so early. Jeez, come on. I mean, good job, I guess. I guess. Anyone still hungover from last night? Yeah, all right. Cool. So, a bit of an outline. I'm, I'm going to break this talk down into two parts. Uh, the first part, I'm going to talk a little about penetration tests, uh, what I think is bad with them, what I don't really like about them. And then I have a philosophical anecdote, which I may be able to explain so that it makes sense, but maybe not. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some 360 no scope YOLO swag, uh, or at least my perception of that. Uh, and then in the second part, we're going to do a we're going to talk about a 12 step process, and um, you know there's going to be some demos, there's going to be some heavies, you know, you get the you get the Team Fortress 2 reference, right? Uh, do I sound? Yeah, do I sound. Okay. I thought there was sound there. Maybe not. Oh well. You're better off without it, actually. So um, let's talk about pen testing, right? The pen is tested. There's some kerning issues there a little bit, but whatever. So uh, you know, what's the worst case scenario, right? You get a pen test, and everyone's like, "Yes, the pen worked fine. We checked your check boxes. Everyone's happy." Um, that's you know, not good, right? No, no one likes that, right? Has anyone had a pen test like that before, or done a pen test like that before? I've done a pen test like that before. It sucks. So hopefully this isn't you because it's really frustrating, right? You know when you're doing it and you're like, oh man, like that that sucked. Like that was boring, right? So here's how to tell, right, if you're getting these pen tests and they're not quite up to snuff, right? There's no user attacks, right? You never get any real demonstration of impact, right? They're like, hey, there's this uh, vulnerability here. You should take a look about it. Great, like did, did you hack me with it? Did you compromise me with it? If the answer is no, then like, well, <laughs> How am I going to take that pen test report and use it to enact some change within my organization? Well, I can't because you didn't do anything. So, uh, you know, no, and the worst is like no validation of findings, right? Like, so it's like, hey, we ran burp, and uh, burp said you might have this, uh, this thing over here, potential, you know, cross site request forgery. It's only on like every page that you browse to. And you're like, great, well, that's an internal portal and no one ever hits it. So, how does that affect me? Well, it doesn't. So, um, you know, and then the worst is no results. Has anyone ever done a pen test and got no results at all? Couple? So, the one or two people, so like, yeah, no results, kind of. Did you make up some results, kind of? Like, you're, so suddenly the scope of ownage gets a lot shallower, and you're like, yeah, like, well, you guys got, you know, don't, you don't have secure cookies enabled, so pff, take that. <laughs> so, so I think a pen test should always have results. So if there's no results, your scope was too tight. It was too tight, right? Because you can always get in. There's always a way in. So if you didn't get results, it's because they gave you a scope that targeted stuff that they know there's not going to be anything there. So widen the scope. And if you're on that, if you're that guy that's on that pen test and you're like, God, God damn it, like, what is this scope? Like three IPs, just like web servers, and they, you know, they do code audits, and I'm just here to check their checkbox for him. You should talk your point of contact into letting you do more stuff so that he gets his money worth. Otherwise, you know, they're just, they're just whatever, throwing money away, right? Uh, the reason they probably do that is the fear of acknowledging or having those security flaws, right? Because it's a lot easier to get that pen test and be like, yay, like, pen test, it came back clean. Okay. Uh, you know, and the findings, right, they're, they're easier to deal with than, and then having a breach, so you should, you should find the find those findings before you have that breach, the real ones, you know, not 
like my users get fished and then once you get in the corporate network, everyone gets owned and not my three IPs didn't come back with anything significant. Okay, so philosophical anecdote, bear with me here. So there's a guy, Nassim Nicholas Taleb. He wrote a book called The Black Swan. Highly recommend it. Uh, he's an economist. He talks a lot about perceived randomness. Uh, he's the kind of guy who's like, if you describe a dice or a casino game as random, he's actually like physically upset, maybe vomiting, because he's like, that's not random. You know, you roll a dice and you get one through six. Even if you rolled a dice and you got one through a million, that's still not random. You know all of the outcomes. You know every outcome that that dice has. Like, randomness is this. You roll a dice and it turns into a duck. And then that duck, like, shits on your front lawn and then flies up and pecks you in the eye and then turns into a sugar cube and sweetens your coffee. Like, that's random. That's really random. No one saw that coming ever. So he describes this thing called the black swan effect. And I'm going to read it off here. It's a metaphor that describes an event that comes as a surprise, has a major effect, and is often inappropriately rationalized after the fact with the benefit of hindsight. He's not talking about security vulnerabilities here, but can you see how that might apply? Right? I don't know what, what new security vulnerability that came out. And now it's on the only thing people can think about. Maybe the new one, I actually haven't had a chance to read it because I was getting pummeled in the Corlin class all week, but you know, maybe, maybe this isn't a big deal as you think, but I kind of think and also hope for my current engagements that I'm running that it is a big deal and I can use it. But, but think about Heartbleed, right? Heartbleed came out and then everyone's like, oh my god, Heartbleed, 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 Heartbleed. Like, yeah, what about all the other stuff? Right? They think Heartbleed's the thing that's going to get them pwned. And sure, you know, it's a vulnerability, but it's just another one and a huge slew. But because it's like a big event, everyone rationalizes it differently after the fact, thinking that it's more likely to happen again or something similar. So. Now, in his book, he talks about another guy. Umberto Eco, and this uh, Umberto Eco character, he's an Italian writer, a philosopher. Uh, he has something which is a considered a very, very large personal library. This library has about 30,000 books in it. And uh, he basically categorizes people into two categories. People who categorize people into one cat. no, I'm just kidding. So when people visit him, they visit his huge library to see it. 30,000 books is quite a lot to have someone in, you know, in your home or mansion or wherever he lives. But uh, they either come in and they're like, hey, wow, you have such a huge collection of books. How many have you read? And then he categorizes other people as the smart people who realize that it's not about how many out of 30,000 books that you've read, but the stuff that you know that you haven't read. You have it in your library. You know that you haven't read it. Now, I'm sure we all have, who's got books in their library that they haven't read? Yeah, me too, like all of them, right? <laughs> but I know that that information is available to me if I need it. So the general abstraction is that the value of the things you do not know sometimes far outweighs the value of the things you know. And people have a tendency to hang on to those things that they know. You find out something, you know it, and then that's all you focus on. But what you need to be doing is thinking and trying to enumerate and trying to find the things that you don't know about, right? Because that's, those are the things that always get us, right? Those are the things that, you know, O-days and shit, right? So anyways, I don't know if that philosophical anecdote made sense, but I got through it, so let's go. I think the sound's working. Anyways, red teaming, 360 no scope YOLO swag. Um, so this is kind of, I'm just gonna hold on. This is kind of my initial thoughts about red teaming when I switched from being a consulting pen tester into like red teaming where the, the scope goes away. You know, the goal is to simulate the, being a real threat actor. The goal is to do whatever. So there's no, there's no scope and you're supposed to be testing defenses in real time instead of just probing for vulnerabilities, right? You have to think about a lot of things that you didn't have to think about before. Because as a consulting pen tester, a lot of times, you know, you just come in, you scan, whatever, it's fine. And uh, when you're red teaming, like I was, I was floored just because I can do whatever and I have to think about all these other things. So it's a lot about eliminate, uh, illuminating the unknown, right? So here's my 12 steps to red recovery. This is, uh, you know, 
how to how to red team good and do good things. And they'll hopefully not get caught and do get caught at the right time. So here's the scenario scope. And I actually was like up at 6 a.m. today and I updated this slide. Because the first time I gave this talk was uh, like a really small conference. I like test it out a little bit. And uh, I gave this slide and I'm like, this is a boring slide because uh, I'm talking about these goals, which like here's the here's the first goals. Hack all the things, cause damage, compromise intellectual property, right? Those are the goals of your red team engagement. And then I thought, you know, what are the actual goals? Right? It's being a change catalyst for that organization, whether you're in-house or whether you're consulting, so that they can come back and be like, look, we need to make our security better. Someone needs that pen test to get Hopefully someone needs that pen test so that they can get things done. They need you to hack them so that they can make people do things. And they need it as leverage, right? If, if they're just checking the PCI compliance checkbox, then, you know, you've already, you've already failed at, at getting that engagement that you want. But, um, and then the goal, so I thought, like, what's my goal when I'm doing these things? Like, looking like a badass, right? You got, you can't roll in and, and then be like, hey, there's no, there's no, yeah, you're good. Checkbox. No, you got to be like, we owned you, ha 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 ha. So, those are those are the real goals, I guess. So, there's a couple of restrictions that normally get placed, even when you're operating in this this realm. So, no denial of service, right? You can't take companies down and be like, ha ha, we did anonymous all over you, and now you're now you're screwed, right? You're down. No, like no one cares. And uh, so, you can't get caught. Well, you can't get caught as long as you don't want to get caught. Um, and no actual physical violence. Uh, there's, there's a guy on our team who frequently wants to like cut off people's hands and use that as leverage and like mail threats to people. So, um, that's typically out of scope, I think. You know who you are. So, let's, let's go into the steps. Step one. Recon. It's always recon. Uh, you know that Dr. Raid one, right? First step of owning a target, it's recon. So you have to find out what the attack surface is. And normally people just go to Google and they start their recon or they go to Maltigo and they start their recon. But there's a lot of things, other things you can do, right? You can call. You can do recon. By, like, hey, when you call, who answers the phone? That's important information. Um, you can stop by 5A visit. I'm supposed to be replacing every word with four with five, so if you if you notice that I'm saying it wrong, go ahead and call me out and I'll take a break and take a drink because I'm doing a bad job. But um, you can stop by and just walk in. A lot of places will let you and, and check things out. You get a lot more information than you do from uh, this external view. And of course, OSINT, right? So the way I typically approach it is start making like a docket on, on every single person that you can find at the company. Find them on LinkedIn through the company, and then every social media that they have, facts about them, where they went to school, uh, things like that. You'll find really interesting things about companies. Basically, basically they'll there'll be these like little groups of people that you're like, I'm sure these guys are friends because they all played football together at a college, and I and all of these guys used to be from this other town, so maybe they all know each other. So. You can kind of get an idea of who works there and what the environment is like, especially for small companies. So let me let me preface and take a step back for a second. Uh, most of the red teaming work I'm doing right now is on small companies, startups, and then you know Silicon Valley based stuff. I'm out in San Francisco. So if you're like, none of this applies to this bank that I'm talking about at you know in Pittsburgh or somewhere. That's where I'm really from. And it's it's different out there. Agreed. But you can still apply the same techniques. So anyways. One of the big things is to identify moments of opportunity. So this is like if the company's having an event and they post about it publicly, that's your in. That event, everyone knows about it, everyone expects it, and if you can leverage that event, you can either show up physically or use it as an efficient campaign, but using like events that are happening becomes very, very powerful. And a lot of times it kind of sucks if your engagement scope is in a period where the company's not really doing anything because now you have to get more creative. Um, other things like acquisitions, press announcements, things like that, ways to find out about those events. So you've scoped out your target. You know what kind of environment they have, hopefully. And uh, you need some malware. So I'm going to tell you about the, the last malware that I had to make when I had to roll my own because I had some requirements, right? I couldn't, I couldn't have my malware 
on the system communicating in clear text. And all my targets were OS X or Linux based. And so basically, I had to come up with something encrypted, and there's no like HTTPS reverse interpreter shell for OS X. And I, for some reason, didn't really feel like writing one because I'm like, well, it's just going to go into an interpreter, and then my like wheat red team hacks are now a part of everything that's in every AV signature ever. So I didn't really want that. Um, so I made something simple because I think simple is good, especially if you're lazy like me. And I wanted a, I wanted a couple, uh, a couple key categories, right? I wanted it encrypted. I wanted flexible command and control. I wanted it to be portable across at least Linux and OS X. Uh, I initially intended it to be portable across Windows too, but the compatibility for that died out pretty quickly. Um, and I wanted the ability to troll, and we'll talk about that later. So here's what I came up with, something that looks a bit like this. Uh, this I, I call it my snail malware. I'm not really sure why. But uh, so this snailed system here, can you guys see the pointer? Yeah. So this snailed system here, what it does first is it calls out to Twitter. And it finds a Twitter account, and it decodes a tweet that's a bunch of random words. It then resolves an IP address and port based on that, and just sends a reverse SSH tunnel back out to a server in Amazon. I then uh, access it through a VPN, SSH into the server, and then can SSH directly into the user's box. And it has to do a couple things under the hood to make this work, like set up private and public key pairs and change permissions and stuff like that, but it's, it's pretty simple. Also, when I, when I was looking for a hacker clip art, I found this. Uh, this is what hackers look like, just so you know. So if you're not dressed like this, and I don't really see many that are, uh, you're doing it wrong. Um, I need to get a hat, I need to get a trench coat. <sighs> so much to do. Anyways, so this was my demo slide in case like the internet wasn't working. This is, yes sir. God damn. I did mean in five mation. All right, I'll try to be better. So, uh, I think internet is working, so let's go to a demo. Is this mic on? Hear me? Cool. Okay. Let's see. So I have this Twitter account. I registered it on the flight out here. Uh, if you if you see here, it's once in your life, which that stands for five. I actually had to change it because for some reason, uh, one of my encoding routines that happens later on uh, was choking on the five, and by that I mean the F O R. Or F O U R. It's okay. So, anyways, basically, I, I put this tweet out here already. And here's how this tweet's generated. I. Oh, right on. <laughs> uh, one sec. Hey, I can't see these screens. Jeez. Do, 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 do. Yay. Yeah, that resolution, huh? So here's this Twitter account. DerbyCon is the best for once in your life. And uh, here's how this tweet was generated. So I have a script. I knew this would bite me. Ah, oh, damn. <laughs> Actually, I forget what this script does. <laughs> I never said it. Oh man, this resolution is killing me. Can you guys still see this? Okay. Okay, so I have this encoder script, and there's a couple hard-coded values, but uh, basically this encoder script takes... <laughs> that, that's my backup script in case I fail to create one here. 
it takes an IP, a port, and a lexicon file. And what this lexicon file is, is any text that I choose that I then uh, take out all the duplicates, take out all non-alphanumeric characters, and then compress it down, and I use it as an index to resolve the IP addresses. So the, each, uh, each word is a reference into an octet, and then the last four words are like, the, the last five words, I'm not even trying up here, damn. The last five words uh, are the port, each digit of the port times nine, so. Don't even talk about the fives in my IP address. And I, I have no idea what this is going to generate. Uh, okay, so I'm using two markers. On the front, it's uh, bread team says, and at the end, it's or something IDK. So basically, uh, these are things that aren't going to occur on the Twitter page. Uh, at first, I was parsing through and finding the tags on, and that lasted for like a week before they changed it somehow, and everything broke. So I'm just like, screw that. I'll use my own uh, start and end delimiters. So this is what I would tweet. Bread team says, provide people pelican pie, what continue your configuration into, uh, or something, I don't know. Um, that's pretty similar. The only thing's different is the port number, so I'm not going to waste time by tweeting it. But you get what happens. The Twitter account tweets it. Now I have another script here called snail maker. And this is a, here, I'll show you it. This is a script that writes a script, which is, So, if you've ever written a script that writes a script and you suck at coding, like me, uh, it's going to look something like this, which is which is super fun to debug. I found a bug in it at, like dinner yesterday. Where it's like, great. I didn't say anything. So, anyways, it basically takes in a bunch of arguments, takes in a bunch of things that I think might be useful, and generates a Python script and does a couple automated things, and we'll, we'll walk through it. But it, it looks like this, it's pretty ridiculous. Five loops. <laughs> you guys are asses. <laughs> okay, so the first thing it asked me for is the lexicon, and I've called it lex. And then an XOR key. Hey, you guys wanna pick an XOR key? Something short, please. Five, got it. All right, the XR key is five. You should have picked, you should have picked five. No. And then the username. This is the username that I'm going to be uh, establishing the SSH tunnel back up to uh, AWS with. And uh, the user doesn't actually have a shell, so if you try and log in with the private key that's going to be everywhere, uh, you shouldn't get a shell, hopefully. I may, may not have. Just don't do it, please. So that username is snail. And the Twitter handle is the once in your life. To resolve it, good job. So the two unique identifiers are bread team says or something IDK. Correct me if I if I'm messing up because you guys are smart. And then uh, I have an option to enable OSX persistence. So basically this technique, uh, what it does is it puts something in the library uh, launch agents of the user's folder and then uses launch control to say, hey, this is a like persistent service that needs to stay on all the time. This does not require root or anything to do. And basically what will happen is if someone sees the process, the, the script running, and they kill it, the operating system will be like, oh, no problem, I got you, and start it back up again until you, until you unload this, uh, this module. So I'm going to enable that also. And then uh, you need a, a label ID, and I'm just going to use uh, five dot once. And I have a uh, key configured already. And then it asked me if I'd like to obfuscate variable names. So I'll show you what this does in a second. I'm just going to let it work. Hopefully this doesn't crash, because sometimes the parsing crashes on this. So that's why that other script is already there that, that works. Four, 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 four. This takes a second. 
This takes too long. Okay. That oh, looks like it's done. Okay, so here's the first version of the script that gets generated. Looks like this. Now, if you see all this crazy stuff, what I'm doing is I'm using that XOR key to, I, I base 64 the lexicon, and then I index into it to get letters that I need. And this base 64 string is encoded with the XOR key. Now, it's not super great security on my script, but it does prevent people who have no idea from what they're doing to, to even running it or trying dynamic analysis on it. Because you can't just run it, you need to provide the XOR key, otherwise it just crashes. And then I didn't want people to just read the source code or be able to run strings on it and get all this stuff out. So every variable that I think is important or every string that I think is important is basically encoded using indexes into this lexicon. Super low tech, super janky crap, but uh, you know, it, it worked well enough. So yeah, that's it. Now the encoding routine that I just talked about, here's, here's what that changes to. So if you read this Python script right now, it's still pretty obvious what's happening. The encoding routine does this. All the variable names now look like this. A Little more confusing. However, that's not good enough. So there's a second encoding routine which does this. And I need to open this in something else because Sublime will try and parse it and fail miserably. So the last version looks like this. It's basically a giant lambda base64 encoded strings that get unpacked on a, what do I need to drink for? Oh, what do I need to drink? Five? Base65? <laughs> I don't even know and I'm killing myself up here. So anyways, I'm sure you guys can see that, huh? What was my XOR key? Five, right? Cool. Hopefully this works. The user will never see this because I'm not going to make them run Python on their system. I'll talk about that later. You see this one generated and it gives me some nice output so I can remember what all those things that I configured. And I should have a shell here. Cool. Looks like it's working so far. Tempting the demo gods really hard using the internet. Okay. Uh. Oops. Yeah, that's right. Okay. One second. VM snapshots, how do they work? Hmm. Oh well, it normally works, I don't know why. Oh well, we gotta move on. But that does work, because I use it every day. That's embarrassing, huh. oh well. All right, so, assuming the script worked and you didn't fail for some random reason, uh, you can be like, I got in. So, how do you get someone to, to run this? Switch back to this one. Okay, don't worry about it. So, I have a couple, a couple pretexts that I like using. One is, I'm IT, and you have a problem, right? And in order to do this, you kind of have to have some internal knowledge about what kind of problems they might have. Uh, so I've used this after I'm already internal to a network to use an IT guy to fish someone else, right? Or, I'm from a company and you know us, so you can look at the, the people, the social recon that you've done, and basically see if they're interacting with people on Twitter and see if they're doing things. And then you can be like, hey, like, you're, you're talking to this company on Twitter? Great, I'm from this company, I'm a brand representative, and we'd really like to interview you, or we'd really like to talk to you about this, or we'd have a survey for you to see how you liked interacting with our company on Twitter. Um, or, hey, I want a job, and your company's awesome, and I'm awesome, so you wanna hire me. Let me send you my portfolio. My port, oh, come on, you're stretching it. 
Um, so what I just used recently was, uh, hey, uh, I'm, a, I'm a design blog, and your offices are beautiful, and we'd like to come and interview. So that worked out really well, actually. Um, or, hey, I'm your friend. I'm registering a, so I see what your name is, and I know you have your normal internal company email, but I've registered a Gmail with your name, and then I get into Google Hangouts. Now, the nice thing about Google Hangouts is when you, when you use that, it doesn't show your email. It just shows your name. So you copy their picture from Google Hangouts by guessing their name. Uh, when you add them as a friend, you can see exactly what picture they're using. You basically recreate them in Google Hangouts. And then you can just message people. And the first time, if they have that setting, they'll, it'll be like, hey, so-and-so wants to contact you. And they'll be like, oh, yeah, I know that guy. Of course, that's weird. And then you can talk to them. So this works really effectively if you can gauge who you're talking to and who they sit next to or work with or, or things like that. So uh, I had someone really on the hook. They're totally talking to me. Everything's cool. I was able to, to share out things with Google Drive and be like, hey. And uh, you know, people ran it, and they sent me the email about why it didn't work. Oh, great. Uh, but so what ended up happening is I'm like, hey, uh, what's up? Like, I need you to run this. And they're like, cool. Oh, sorry, I didn't see your message. I get the reply a few hours later. It's like 8 o'clock at night. And I'm like, oh, they're probably home. There's no chance that they're in the office. So I can message them very safely, and they won't think that it's this person I'm pretending to be. So I message them, like, hey, like, hey, are you still online? Hoping for them to be like, yeah. And I'm like, can you check this out for me and send them a, like, a jar file or something like that? They're like, no, hey, who is this? <laughs> Oh, it's me, of course, <laughs> LOL. And then I'm like, oh, something bad is happening. I'll talk to you tomorrow. And they're like, no, seriously, who is this? I'm standing next to X guy right now. <laughs> like, it's 8 o'clock. What are you doing? Oh, startups. <laughs> so in another scenario, I'm internal. I'm an IT guy. And uh, we call the person and... We're like, hey, I need you to verify something with your account. Please, please run this jar file. And uh, I try to send it through Gmail, and that doesn't work because there's a policy rule and it blocks jar files. The way you get around that is sharing them directly out through Google Drive, by the way. Uh, so I'm like, oh, here's a Dropbox link, and it works. And then, like, around the time they're clicking it, they're like, is this a security test? I'm thinking, like, nah, no, it's not a security test. And they're like, okay, they're always testing us. And I'm like, yeah. So, so I mean, you're going to get in because, because people want to trust you. They, they want to. They're, they're not suspicious like us all the time. They want to trust you. They want things to work smoothly. So you'll get in. Better speed this up. So after you're in, what do you do? Normal guy, normal blog. By, by the way, YouTube video to GIF is amazing. I couldn't find a GIF of this, and I made one last night, and I was very happy that I had this idea that that might be a thing, and I Googled it, and it's just like, yeah, that's totally a website. Thank you. So, uh, so once you're in, what you want to do is you want to mimic normalcy. You, you don't want to be really weird. You don't want to drop in and start nmap scanning, right? So <laughs> that GIF is getting some people, isn't it? <laughs> okay, so here's a few ways you can, you can find out what people normally do once you're on their box, right? Bash history, if it's a Linux box or an OS X box. You can also see if they have any SSH connections open. That would be inbound or outbound. Because you also want to know if there's people in the environment that are SSHing into people's box, because guess what? You want to know that guy. You want to be that guy, technically. Um, you can also look at known hosts, right? If there's nothing happening right now, have people accepted RSA keys from other places? That works sometimes. Uh, a recent one that the connection pointed out to me was PB Paste. On OS X, people have stuff in their clipboard, PB Paste. You get with the contents of their clipboard. You know what goes in clipboards a lot? Passwords. Great. Also W, also last, seeing who's connected into the system. Another way to see if uh, admins are connecting in or if there's a service account that has access to all the boxes across the organization. And then, you know, go to the grocery store. So there's a sequel to this original video. This one's Normal Guy, Normal Walk. There's a going to the grocery store sequel. I recommend both. So you want to move laterally. Curb tickets are a good way. There's a lot to say about them, and I'm going to say nothing about them. Uh, more importantly, there's something we discovered recently, SSH Control Master. Uh, basically, it's something that allows multiplexing through SSH. And uh, everyone's like, yeah, this is great. You should enable this. You want to know why? Because if you're connected into a server, and then you need to connect into the same server again, like the SCP files or something like that, or any SSH connection, 
you won't get prompted for a password or two-factor auth or anything. So what happens is, I look at bash history, I look at current connections, I type literally the same command, and instead of the two-factor auth that's supposed to be there, I get dropped in with no password or anything. Thanks, multiplexing. So, anecdotes, yeah. So, step five. It's more spy stuff. After you kind of already got this general lay of the land, you know the people, you know kind of who's who and what's going on in the network, uh, you need to do internal recon. Uh, so, once you get that first shell inside, your initial recon and OSINT phase can start again because suddenly there's these whole new information sources that are internal. Uh, so, who here thinks it's like first step network scanning once you drop into an environment? Network scan. No one's raising their hands. Everyone knows it's a trick, right? Or everyone knows that, you know, that's going to get you caught really fast, right? You don't want to get caught. So instead, focus what the user has access to, get stuff, and then check it out. So one of them is internal wikis, right? You get access to an internal wiki, oh my, like everything. It's like being an employee there, which really helps when you're trying to pretend to be employees there. So the main goal is finding the who associated with the what and targeting that person instead of trying to target network services inside the network, right? You don't want to find servers and start beating on them and throwing exploits at them because if there's any IDS in place, which do you know if there is one? I don't know. If there's any IDS in place, like you're going to get picked up really fast. But if you're doing normal stuff that users normally do and you learn about their environment first and then you learn about who has access to the stuff that you want and then you target them specifically the same way you got in in the first place, you're going to go undetected. So. so how do we take stuff, right? So we're moving on. We're now on step five. And we're just going to, we're just going to take things. So if you're on Linux, Key loggers, five great success. So this is a key logger I wrote like in the in the middle of a pen test, and it is the jankiest, silliest key logger ever. There's a there's a command called show key on Linux that just echoes back out whatever like character codes for keys that are being pressed, and then there's a file that like has the reference for what those evaluate to. Uh, so basically, it only runs for 10 seconds if there's no user input. I want it to run all the time, so I wrote a small Python script that keeps it running. Uh, takes out all the like header information of the output of the command and then just keeps like keeps doing that And then I have another Python script I drop down and, and decode it and I get keylogger output and I, I think this requires root, but it's it's pretty easy to get on Linux so. Now here's here's the new thing that I found that I'm really really psyched about so on OS X Which if you want a keylog on OS X anyone in here written an OS X keylogger? Yeah, me neither Anyone want to know why it's really tough? Because there's this assistive devices settings, which is pretty much impossible to enable unless you're in kernel land already, meaning you already have root, and the ability to do that there. And you need the user interaction through the UI to enable these assistive devices. And I haven't found a way to, to make it happen any way else. So remember that whole, like, what's the easiest way to get someone's password? What's the easiest way to get someone's password? Right. So this is what we're doing. This OSA script is an Apple scripting language that's built in, and it allows you to tell any application, no, no root required, by the way, to tell any application to display any dialogue with any field that you want that says anything. So you type in this command, and this is what you get. Right? And it just, the, the, the system preferences is updating, and actually I think I just found a thing that allows you to cause that to come to the foreground, but I haven't included it yet, because who knows if that works, and I'm already zero for one on demos. So. It comes to the five ground. And then when someone types in their password, it gets echoed right back to the shell that you have. So you hit him with my malware, makes a reverse SSH connection, you have that user's access privilege, you use it to ask them for their own password, and then you have root. And then you know, you take their, you take their keychain and you take their cookies and you decrypt everything and then you have access to more. And say they have like one password or last pass or some other key, you know, uh, key pass, some password manager that's a different password, great. You can make that app ask them for their password. I know, right? Shit. 
God damn it. Okay, so I have a demo for this too. And you see how it works already. But I wrote a small script to, uh, to make it easier on myself. I think also on the flight here. This is the five once in your life script. So basically, I can define an application if I know what the application name is. Like, so system preferences is system preferences in quotes. Uh, it seems to be the name of the like app container folder that sits in the applications folder, and you're able to call it by that name. So I just automated it. So since I'm using a Mac and I'm targeting Macs a lot, I can use like things on my own system to, to generate something really quickly. So I'm just going to pick a local application. I don't know. What do you guys want to pick? Firefox? KeyPass? OK. Um, I have, did you guys want to specify anything particular? Give me your password five great success. Cool. Um, so I added something in the script that already makes it uh, in the clipboard using pbcopy. And I can just paste it in. Look, keypass launched. Keypass is bumping up and down in my system tray. I don't care. Oh, give me your password five crazy. Sure. <laughs> Great, and here we go. Password. Thanks. So it's pretty effective, pretty easy. Okay. So step five, uh, YOLO swag. So in the course of an engagement, there's going to be a chance where these easy movements stop working. So you have to actually pull out all the stops. So in one instance, we have a hardened target. We need to step up our game. right? So we're on Linux boxes, and we're screenshotting people's systems. So here's, a, here's something that took me a while to figure out, which is simple, so it shouldn't have. But if you're in an SSH connection and you want to screenshot the user screen, you need to add display equals colon zero at the front of it. And then you can import, which is a screenshot utility, grab a screenshot of the user's system. Now, I was really smart at first. I was like, you know what? My Mac makes a noise when I make a screenshot. Maybe Linux is the same. So I look it up. And I'm like, yes, totally, there's a WAV file. So I go and I rename it on that system. And I'm like, yes, great. But then I moved to about 10 other systems, and I'm doing the same thing, and I don't remember to do it on a single other system. So everyone's hearing these screenshots. You know, they're listening to music, and it's like, like all day, right? <laughs> so, and then on the same user, we're proxying all their traffic through an AWS server so that we can grab stuff and hopefully get their two-factor authentication code and like go into this secure environment. Uh, and we're rebooting Chrome, and we're killing processes so the applications, like, the settings will apply. And it's, you know, the, the user, like, we, we, we start on this first guy, and it's just like, he seems okay with it. Like, he's just like, yeah, like, Chrome rebooted, whatever, like, it's fine. Like, things are slower than normal, but I can still get work done. Great. So, uh, let me get really daring. Uh, and we see this guy, he's, he's, RDP'd into another computer. And we're like, you know what? He probably got sick of all his processes crashing, and he RDP'd into his other computer so that he could use the software on there, because Windows is better than Linux. <laughs> That's what he thought. That's what he thought. I didn't say that. Just five git I ever said that. So what we can do is we can freeze his RDP process, and then since we already have his creds, RDP to his system. So on his desktop, nothing's happening. It's just frozen until he goes to try and use it. And uh, then we have RDP access, and we have all the shells that we need, right? We have whatever, whatever he was doing. Uh, so doing this stuff is pretty, pretty dangerous, right? Eventually, you're going to forget to do everything, and you're going to get caught. So what happens when you get caught? Now, now, you're supposed to get caught. You should get caught eventually, and I'll talk about that more. But what happens when you get caught? So they get, they get suspicious, right? They can see people SSHing in their systems, et cetera, et cetera. So what happens is users will send emails into security. They're like, hey, yo, screenshots on a computer, like, I'm mad about this. 
However, if you have their password and you have access to all their stuff, you can help them. You can be like, actually, everything's fine. And then just delete that you sent that email. So you're following up with security. You're letting them know, like, everything's cool. And uh, you can also, like, organize their inbox a little bit and filter out any further messages from security. <laughs> so. But eventually, you're not going to be able to do this for everyone. So you are going to get caught. And so coming back to talking about blue team and red team, it's important to get caught on engagements. Because if you, if you don't get caught, then you never know what it would be like if your blue team found someone. And they don't get to play too, and then it's boring for everybody, right? Engagement ends and you never get caught. So when you get caught, I mean, you should get caught. So even if you're like, whoa, we stealthed through the whole way, it didn't matter, no one caught us, we got everything. Cool. Engagement's over. Make some noise. See if you get caught. Because if you made a lot of noise and you didn't get caught, that's a finding. That's something that you need to let them know about. Hey, like, not only did we go through your network and steal everything, but then we end map scanned everything. We ran Nikto against every web server that you have, and we started throwing Metasploit models, and then we shelled people with Meterpreter unencoded, and no one saw it. Like, that's, that's a finding. They should know about that. <laughs> Hopefully, you will get caught. And you need to know this threshold. And when you, when you find this threshold, something magical happens, because the engagement gets way more fun. And remember about trollability? This is where that comes into place. So you're caught. Time to go random. See if you can survive their incident response. Hopefully they have incident response. And if you can survive it, that's a finding too. That's something you need to let them know about. And you get to fight for a foothold. It's fun. It's like a sweet step. So talking about trollability, what's probably going to happen is they'll get a hold of your malware, and they'll start blocking your C2. Well, that's why I'm using Twitter to resolve my C2, so I can change it. So the first time they block it, I just change it. So if they look, hey, there's a SSH connection out, and it's bad, block. Great. New tweet, new C2, Amazon Elastic IP, fine. Like, it takes like two seconds. Then they block that one. Then they block that, and the next one. And then they get smart, and they write a script to block everything. You see what the problem here? My new C2 is Google. My next C2 is Twitter and Facebook and your website and every website that you go to all the time. Are you blocking these automatically? Oops. <laughs> yeah. So if you manage to survive, the next step, step five, of course, is to rampage, right? Everything during the pen test that you didn't do because you thought you would get caught, it's time to do it, right? See if you can get all that extra stuff. See if they catch you eventually, and then and then close it out. And that should be the end of your engagement. I don't know what's on this next slide. Ooh, that's. <sighs> so, step twelve. I mean five, uh, is to drink and drink. Right? If you're doing this internally, this is especially important. Right? The blue team, the ones we've been talking about all the time. Those guys are mad, right? Because you've been trolling them, you've been making their lives miserable, they've been working later. You gotta take them out, take them out for drinks, be nice to them, because at the end, we're all fighting to make things more secure. It's not about red versus blue, it's about red and blue making things good, right? I'm not getting down on one knee, okay? And that is the second worst thing that has ever happened to me. <sighs> so, final step five, any questions? Kaboom! Kaboom! Do I have time still? Does anyone have a question? Um... Google, I love you five ever. And then just watch the video, because if I try and explain it, you're going to be certain that I need to wear a helmet all the time. <laughs> so in my last minute, I'm going to try for a demo that I skipped. Uh, remember I told you about making jar files? 
So I wrote another script. It basically takes my payload and gives me a jar dropper. Doesn't really matter which one I pick. So it allows me to provide any arguments I need, and I think for this one it's LOL dongs, that's the XOR encryption key. <laughs> Don't laugh, grow up people, come on. So, and then the output jar file, um, I'm not gonna try and explain why it's called a Lexus, but I'm gonna call it LOL dongs. And then um, the destination payload, so I like to drop stuff in var temp because that's what all the APT do. And uh, it, otherwise it's just gonna drop it locally, you probably don't want it on their desktop. And then you can auto run the payload, and then any more commands can be run, so like say, LOL dongs, right? That will actually make the, on, on OS X systems, make it uh, just like speech to text and just splurt stuff out. And then the option to delete the payload after it's running, um, I typically don't do this because I want my persistence to work. And then more importantly, having the jar display a dialog message, right? Like, so I like to say um, Java version too recent or something like that. That's the thing, right? So then I have loldongs.jar, and maybe I can get a demo to work. And then you run this, and the shell comes out, and then I don't have Java. Never mind. Fuck me, right? <laughs> I, I think I reverted to a snapshot way too old, so okay. Uh, anyways, talk's over. Thank you for coming. If you have any questions, I'll, any questions, real quick? Uh, no, the dropper will drop the Python uh, script in the var temp and then kick it off. Uh, the, the code looks like this. Really simple. This one needs to be obfuscated more, but it basically makes a new file. <clears throat> Fuck that turn off ice. Uh, <laughs> makes a new file, writes out to it, and then, you know, kicks it off and then displays a dialog message. And then the user goes, oh, there was an error. Your thing didn't work. This works if they have Java. If they don't have Java, though, uh, which I actually encountered, uh, what you can do, especially for targeting OS X, is make an app. There's an app uh, called Platypus that will allow you to select the icon and select what it's going to run and select any arguments to it, which meets all my needs. So I make an app, and then um, the app can display whatever. But basically, if they download it from the internet, they'll have to right-click and click open if they have the default settings, right? But if you put it on a flash drive and say you're already interviewing someone for something, and you're like, hey, sorry, I need you to sign this consent form. I have it on a USB drive here. Boom. They sign the consent form, which is a different form, but you click this one first. Boom. App runs. You're good to go. So if they don't have Java, that's, that's the solution. Other questions? Cool.